Okay, so here's our friend H. pylori. It's a gram negative bacillus. Now, you guys have been with us for the antibiotic videos, and if you haven't seen them, you'll wanna check those out. But we all know that gram negative is harder to treat. Bacillus just means the shape of the bug, and we'll see that on our reports when you're looking at those. Now, the H. pylori hides in between mucus and epithelial cells. So here's the deal. Here's why you can survive longer living in there, because it's in between the mucus and the epithelio. So that's why the gastric acid doesn't kill H. pylori, because sadly, it's protected by that layer of mucus and the bicarbonate. Okay, so keep in mind, why do H. pylori survive gastric acid? Because my own body protects them with the mucus and the prostaglandins and the bicarbonate. This is actually the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease. I know you may have been taught that, or in your life, people may have told you, oh, stress is what does it, but really, uh, H. pylori is really the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease. So, we've talked about H. pylori, that nasty bug that hides in between our mucus and gets protected from gastric acid. Now let's talk again about NSAIDs. We briefly discussed those, but they inhibit prostaglandins. So now that it's been a minute since we talked about NSAIDs, can you remember what is the end result of less prostaglandin? Pause the video, take a minute, and write yourself the answer to that question in the margin of your notes. Why is the inhibition of prostaglandins a cause of peptic ulcer disease? Remember, prostaglandins are what help keep us healthy levels of mucus and bicarbonate. And if you take a drug like NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that inhibit prostaglandins, that means we'll have less of them available, you have less healthy levels of mucus that has bicarbonate that will neutralize gastric acid. That's why people who have to take lots of NSAIDs, people usually with joint pain and arthritis are taking high doses of these medications for their anti-inflammatory effects. They're taking high doses of these medications over long periods of time. And sometimes we even need to take some real steps to help protect that stomach lining for them. Now we talked about gastric acid. A healthy stomach lining protects that very sensitive stomach lining. Remember that cupcake? If you're in too much of a hurry and you try and frost it too quickly, you just end up with a mess of cake stuff in your frosting. Doesn't look very pretty. Still tastes pretty good, but doesn't look very pretty. Same thing. If we have uh, those cells, that really fragile, beautiful lining of our stomach is exposed directly to gastric acid, it's not protected well enough by the bicarbonate and the mucus, then that's how the gastric acid is gonna injure those mucosal cells. It activates the pepsin, that's the enzyme in our stomach that just chews things up, which is great if I just had a burger, not good if it's digesting my own stomach lining. Now, the last two are uh, lifestyle things. If someone already has peptic ulcer disease, um, well, we don't recommend smoking for anyone, but smoking and alcohol are also problematic for someone with peptic ulcer disease. So we would want to encourage the patient to really limit, and if they could eliminate, that would be fantastic. But remember, these are very difficult habits to give up, and so it's not enough to just tell your patients, you have to stop. You wanna work with your patients, help them identify how it will help them, and just encourage them, educate them in a kind and non-judgmental way that, hey, I understand that you smoke and you drink a fair amount of alcohol. This is what it's doing to your stomach lining. So you don't wanna be judgmental. We all have things that are challenging for us, but help the patient decide that that's a better choice for them to stop smoking and to limit their alcohol. Because these things increase their gastric acid, they make less bicarbonate, be produced in your stomach, so then we've got less ability to neutralize that gastric acid, and so their peptic ulcer disease takes longer to heal and we could possibly develop even additional sores. So, when we're looking at back, as we look back at these, I want you to think about what are the causes of peptic ulcer disease? Well, we talked about four major causes of peptic ulcer disease. Without looking at the actual notes, see if you can number those in the margin of your notes, one, two, three, and four.
Okay, good work. So you listed the four most common causes of peptic ulcer disease. So for H. pylori, we're gonna use antibiotics. For NSAIDs, we're gonna try to encourage the patient to limit those as much as possible while they still get good pain relief, but we're also gonna consider a drug called misoprostol. Now, wait a minute, it sounds like I'm going really quickly through this, but I'm just giving you an overview, and then we'll go back through these medications much more slowly. So we're gonna hit those four main areas, kind of give you a quick snapshot of what we use, and then I'll go over them in much more detail. So for H. pylori, antibiotics. For NSAIDs, we're gonna try to get you to limit them as much as possible and consider using misoprostol. For the gastric acid, we're gonna consider histamine receptor antagonist and write a little H2 next to that, because that's the name of the receptors in the stomach that we're blocking or antagonizing. Proton pump inhibitors, next to that, just write PPI, because that's what we'll call them moving forward. Mucosal protectants, that's one that's gonna kind of protect that stomach lining, and then antacids, Remember, those are over-the-counter, meaning I can buy them at CVS or any drugstore, and they're not the most effective, but they work pretty quickly. And smoking, while we don't recommend it for anyone, we're gonna encourage patients to stop smoking and to also limit their alcohol use. Okay, so that is your quick snapshot view. And so I'd kind of mark those as summary slides, as if I just wanna remember, hey, what are the big overarching concepts that we're gonna talk about next? That's the key for those slides. So let's talk about H. pylori. Um, there's some testing options for H. pylori. I told you lots of us are walking around with it. In fact, you could have it hiding in your body right now, but it doesn't mean you're gonna develop pe um, peptic ulcer disease. Now the test we can do, we can do a serum antibody test, that's a blood test. We can do a urea breath test, which that doesn't involve sticking you, so most people prefer that. Or we can do a stomach biopsy. Whoa, that is really invasive. So when we're thinking about H. pylori testing, we definitely need to test people who have peptic ulcer disease to see if they have H. pylori. Because if they do, remember, that's a bacteria. So we want to use a minimum of two antibiotics to treat it. Now, just as a little sidebar, tuberculosis is another disease process that we always wanna treat with multiple medications. Okay, when it comes to treating that nasty bug H. pylori, remember it hides behind my own personal defenses in my stomach lining, protected from that gastric acid by my own bicarbonate and mucus. I gotta give it the old one-two punch, all right? So take a look at those antibiotics listed at the bottom of your screen. I want you to read through each one. Now take a minute, and what do you remember or what do you recognize about those drugs? Which one of them is a penicillin? Well, remember, a clue is it'll end in cillin. And I also want you to put a giant two by that note because you need to remember that you have to use at least a minimum of two antibiotics to get rid of that nasty little critter.